bring to you this morning grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior who raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. Please be seated. Who do you think you are? A question that we're going to be asking over the course of the next couple weeks, the one that we asked last week, and when we ask again today, who do you think you are? Not a question of accusation, but one of introspection. A question of, at your quiet moments, at those times when you are uh, really reflecting at your core of cores, who are you? An important question because as we understand who we are, when we know, when you know who you are, you know what to do. And if you don't know who you are, then where are we in this life? What is the meaning? Why do I get out of bed every morning? What is the point of all this? I don't love all of this. What am I, what am I really aiming for? Last week, we talked about and encouraged you that you're an ambassador. You're one that's been placed exactly where God has designed you to be to, to share in exactly the ways that God has asked you to share. As we ask this question, who do you think you are? We said, it's right where you're at. You are a unique person in the place where you're at and an opportunity to be an ambassador, one on behalf of God to the people that are immediately around you. And this morning we have a new answer for that. Masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. Now, it comes from Ephesians chapter 2. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And maybe you're looking up there and saying, well, where's the word masterpiece? It's uh, buried under that word workmanship. I'll teach you a little bit of Greek this morning here, only because this one's really easy to pronounce. Uh, the word is poema. Can you say it, say it with me? Poema. Kind of sounds like the word poem, doesn't it? And it is indeed the word where we get that. Poem, a, a masterpiece, something that's been carefully crafted together, designed exactly for how it is supposed to be Poema, you are God's poema. You are God's workmanship. You are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do the good works, not just any, not just the ones that you want to do, but the ones that he's prepared in advance for you to do. Now, in order that we can understand this uh, verse in the second chapter of Ephesians, we got to understand where Ephesians is coming for, from in the first place. Otherwise, we're uh, tempted to pull this out of context and put our own meaning on it. We got to understand what the original writers were intending. And so we have to understand, uh, Ephesians is a book that's written by a pastor, a guy named Paul, written to a church in Ephesus to the Ephesian people. And there, as he's writing in Ephesus, different than some of the other books that he wrote where there was a problem that had come up or, or a thing where they'd misunderstood something and he was trying to correct that, this was just another dose of the good stuff. They had to understand that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, that he was their personal savior, that this made a difference in their lives now and a difference in their eternity but he wanted to get them to the next step. He wanted to give them another dose. He wanted them to understand the bigger picture of all this, how it all fits together. Indeed, that the end goal is that everything is put under Christ, he says in the first chapter, that all of it would fit in there. In fact, uh, in our gospel lesson for today, I think uh, John describes it really well in terms of uh, how it all fits together, uh, echoing what uh, Paul says there in Ephesians. Uh, this is John chapter 3, uh, there at verse 21. He's just gotten done talking about that uh, the gospel in a nutshell, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And he goes on to talk about how there's light and darkness, and Jesus Christ is like this light that's come into the world that exposes the darkness, and those that are in the dark don't want a piece of it because they don't want their, their things to be exposed. But he says, but these who are living in the light, those who are exposed and living in this way, it says in verse 21, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is where Paul is starting as well. See that all that is at work in the midst of it is done through God. But then as he gets into Ephesians chapter 2, he's saying, now, 
in order that you understand this is the big picture. Now let me help you understand how we're going to get there. And Ephesians chapter 2 gets us to that. How are we going to get there? What is the plan in order that we might be this masterpiece, this workmanship of God that He's designed for us to be? Indeed, we are a masterpiece, but an unlikely and a peculiar one. I don't know about you, but when you think about masterpiece, isn't something more like this well, what comes to mind? Uh, this is the work of Michelangelo. It's his David. Or maybe you're a Da Vinci, Mona Lisa kind of person. Or perhaps uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony would be the masterpiece for the musicians out there. Or those that love liter literature, uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. These are masterpieces. They, they fit the definition in our mind. Something that uh, requires extraordinary skill. That's received much critical praise. That's the greatest work in this person, this creator's career. That's something of outstanding creativity, skill, or workmanship. Something that's been made with the very best materials by the very, very best craftsmen using the greatest skill and ability and creativity that, that we could even think of. Something that as you think of each one of these things, they are something that is treasured. Something that is protected. Not a, a single one is used what, for what these sorts of things normally get used for. David uh, doesn't sit in the courtyard adorning someone's after-dinner party. A Mona Lisa is not on the side of, of somebody's living room in order that it might bless their daily life. Uh, the, the music never sits on the music stand. The book is never read on a bedside table, but they're put in a museum. They're protected and, and left off on their own. Unused. Not there to be used, but rather to be admired. And we are not that kind of masterpiece, which is a breath of fresh air, because maybe as you think about how we're going to get there, as we think about that we're this masterpiece, we don't see ourselves on the level of something like this, but we say, okay, Pastor Paul, I don't see where you're going to get there from here. And he says, let me show you. Open up your Bibles if you've got them with you. Pull out your smartphones, whatever way that works for you. Open to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 1. If you don't have either one of those nearby, you can just open up to the readings in your bulletin. And Ephesians uh, chapter 2 verse 1 is also in there. I'd encourage you to read along with me. Because in, indeed we're not that kind of masterpiece. We are not, well... We are made by the best creator ever, yes, but the best materials, not even close. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, Paul addresses the Christians there in Ephesus, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You're like a pile of trash. Your junk that's left over. You're dead. You, you who are supposed to be followers aren't even able to do a single thing that's good, much less respond to the Creator in any way. You are totally deteriorated and dead. On top of that, you're ones that are directed by another master, as it goes on to say in verse 2. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Not only that, not only did you follow another master, but you're disobedient in your actions. It goes on to say, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. Not only in what we did, but, but even in our desires, even in our thoughts, we were disobedient as well. Following its desires and its thoughts, it continues in verse 3, and finally... Putting the nail in the coffin, quite literally, deserve to be destroyed. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, deserving to be punished by God, deserving to be separated from Him forever. We are unlikely materials. But yet we have verse 4. But God in His great love for us God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. 
Through Christ, we are created to be his masterpiece. Do you see it up there? The reflection on the wall is from a light that is cast on that pile of trash to create the image against the wall. It's a work done by Tim Noble and Sue Webster called Dirty White Trash. They'd amassed six months of the artist's rubbish, as they called it, and used it to create this. An amazing reversal, taking the most unlikeliest of materials and using them to create a masterpiece in the same way as God did in us. And God raised us up, we're verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed to us in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God did this in order that you wouldn't just be saved, he says to the Ephesians. It isn't just for you that you would have eternal security in him, but that others might know this as well, that by the life that you live, that Jesus Christ, that God the Father, that the Holy Spirit, that the, our Holy Trinity God that has come to us in Jesus Christ, that has blessed us with the Holy Spirit, might be praised and glorified so that more and more people might know him as their Lord and Savior as well. I am using you, he's saying, to do something beautiful. He summarizes again in verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, not by your works, he means, so that no one can boast. You have been saved by grace. That word in its original uh, language, saved by grace, is, is a word that both describes a completed action. This is something that is done completely for you and also something that has ongoing things. You are saved. It is an ongoing uh, meaning in this time, a continuing results. You are saved. You are now one that is hearing the direction of your master. As to the disobedience and to the, the ways of thoughts and words and deeds, what Christ has done for you has overshadowed that, and that is what God sees instead. And so as it comes to the destroying, as it comes to deserving the destruction, he says, come and be with me. I love you. And I want you to be with me. But for now, I have something for you to do that others might be blessed in this as well. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for you are, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Indeed, we are God's peculiar masterpiece. Not one that is to be unused and just admired, but admired because of how God uses us. This is the plan, and it always has been, even from the very beginning. Did you hear what was read in Psalm, Psalm 139? God says, for, this is uh, David, the psalmist, uh, praying to God, and he's speaking to God. He says, for you created my inmost being. And what he says about himself is true about us as well. He says, for you created God, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God has been preparing in advance for you. For this time, for this place. It's just uh, uh, let this soak in a little bit. Repeat after me. I am God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus. To do good works that he has prepared. And I get it. You may not see it. You may not see it now. This is the intention of the artist as you would look at this pile of trash. You're not supposed to see it. And maybe you don't see it either. You look at your life and maybe it's more of a, a pile of, of rubbish, of broken dreams, of things that aren't. 
Maybe you look at your life now and and you say to yourself, this is not where I wanted to be. Maybe you find yourself now single and hoping to be married, uh, wishing for children but not having yet a family. Maybe you don't yet have the things that you want yet. You were hoping yet to, by this point, to be financially stable, to have that job that would get you here. You were hoping that by this point, the types of relationships that that would be built would lead you to a place of calm and comfort, but yet you find yourself lonely. Maybe you'd hoped by this point in life, as you've been a Christian for a little while now, that that your faith would have developed in such a way that as the crises of life come, that you wouldn't turn in on yourself, that you wouldn't lose hope altogether, but that you would find peace in God, and you struggle to find that. You say, God, how can you use this? This isn't where I wanted to be, and I see it's not where you wanted me to be either, and yet he does. You may not see it, but he gives you everything you need for what he has prepared you for. He uses everything in your life to bring about his purposes. And in fact, friends, you have already begun even though you don't know it, and and the encouragement today is to know who you are and and even more intentionally be about what God has designed for you to be because he's put you in those places. As a spouse, as a parent, as a child, as a student, as a worker, as a friend, as a neighbor. And he's given you abilities that you can see. He's given you the sensitivity to notice when when someone is in need. And the encouragement here is don't ignore it. But be intentional in it. And let Christ shine through you. You are a masterpiece, a peculiar one, because of how masterfully God uses you. Do those things. This is your purpose. This is where meaning and direction and purpose and significance in life comes. God is working right where you're at. Jesus, the light of the world, shining in and through you to create something beautiful that you may not ever see fully but it doesn't mean he's still not doing it. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, help us to seek you in your word and to listen well, doing what you have prepared for us to do, not just for our own benefit, but for that of our neighbors and in order that you would get glory and others might know you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.